Yeah, uh, welcome all of you um, from Nairobi, Uganda, South Africa. We have uh, people from um, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, uh, from Germany. Um, wow, quite a good, good attendance today as always. Um, so please keep letting us know where you're coming from. I see somebody from South Africa as well. Um, mm, Senegal, USA. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Leah from Netherlands. Good. Thank you. And I think now it's five minutes past, five minutes on top of the hour. So we will start now. And uh, already we have about 118 people and they're still joining. So welcome. For those of you who've joined um, uh, a little later, um, remember we have interpretation for English and French. So go to the globe sign at the bottom and choose interpretation. You can choose uh, either English or French so that you are able to follow this conversation. Um, good. And with me today, uh, before I introduce the panelists, is my partner in crime as always, Edwin Masharia, Global Managing Partner of Dalberg Advisors, with whom we've been hosting this, uh, this uh, African Dialogues for over two years. You can wave, uh, Edwin, and everyone can see your hair has grown longer uh, <laughs> from the last time we had this here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the, the hair has grown longer, but it was also shaped it to look longer rather than the big afro that I was spotting for a while. Great yeah. to have everybody here. I saw somebody from Brooklyn, which is fantastic that we have folks who are not even thinking about the country, but literally the locality they're in. Uh, yes. Welcome to this to, to this one. And this promises to be a really interesting one because it, it, right. it elevates the conversation at a macro level and at a global mm -hmm. level. And we have a fantastic panel, which I'll let you introduce Dr. G uh, uh, as we, so we can get going. Excellent. And, you know, in Kiswahili, because, you know, I don't know how many of you know that uh, Kiswahili is now an official language of the African Union, uh, in addition to all the others, which is a great win for uh, the Eastern and Central Africa region. And there is a saying that says, Akili ni nyuele, which means intelligence is here, literally interpreted. So I guess Edwin has more intellect than I do, because his hair is more than I do. Uh, for me, it's all gone uh, because of all the pressures I have to deal with uh, on my corner. Well, 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 um, it is eight years, eight months and 16 days to go to SDG 2030 target. So we are going to have the, you know, the 2030, all the targets we set up for the sustainable development goals. We have eight years and eight months and 16 days to go. And uh, this particular Africa Dialogues has been running on for the last two years. And now is the third year of the pandemic. We know in many areas now, the pandemic seems, seems to be waning. That's what we think. I was just having a conversation earlier with one of the panelists, Professor Shisana, and there are kind of uh, fears that there could be another wave in many different places that like we are seeing also in, uh, in the US and other places. So we can't let our guard down. Uh, but we know that even as we discuss the seemingly waning pandemic with the reduction of public health measures, we know that we have to think about the future, about a reemergence of this pandemic, or even an emergence of a future one. And therefore we have to think about how to build back better, how to develop uh, a system that is people-centered, planetary-centered, and resilience of the health systems to ensure that everyone is safe now and in the future. Remember that this conversation needs your comments. So please use the chat to tell us your comments as we continue to discuss. This second phase of Africa Dialogues, as you can see, in the first phase, we tended to border a lot or to be very deliberate about our speakers, and we drew a lot of our speakers from the African continent. As you can see in this particular phase two of the Africa Dialogues, the beginning of this phase two, which is more looking at focusing on building back better, we've opened up and we have a great panel that I'm going to introduce that's across from across the world, from across all the continents, almost all the continents uh, across the world. The reason for this is because we want to discuss the G7 and its relevance. We want to discuss the group of seven, which is, of course, as you know, the group of seven is the US, is the UK, is Germany, is Japan, Canada, France, and Italy. And one of the panelists, Professor Anna Katarina, will be talking more about the G7 and why the G7 and how the G7 works so that we can be able to participate in this conversation. 
The G7, as it is, is the high income countries, the countries we were calling out for vaccine equity. Many of us, uh, you know, rent our voice to call out the G7 because a lot of the G7 countries are the ones that were actually holding the vaccines that we needed here in Africa. And we have been fairly successful in those calls. Right now, Africa has received over 760 million doses and about 506 million have been administered. That's about 66% of all the doses received. But that translates to only about 15% of the African population vaccinated for COVID. So we still a long way to go. And we know that the impact of this delay is yet to be seen. We could have emergence of, 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 of variants and all these kinds of things. So we need to pay attention to the relevance of the G7 in ensuring health equity. But is it possible? Is it possible with all the nationalism we've seen for the G7 to care? Or does it really even bother about Africa? And this is the conversation that we are going to have. Of course, the G7 is more than 40% of the global economy. It contributes 80% of development assistance to health generally. So you cannot ignore the G7. And of course, this again is why we thought this is an important conversation to have on the Africa dialogues. But there are many other conversations beyond health. It's planetary health. Uh, it's about the changing uh, climate conversation. What is the relevance of the relationship between the G7 and Africa? And how do we take this forward? So as we go forward, the, com the conversation we are going to have today is, is global health equity truly achievable? And I'm going to ask shortly that one of our panelists, after I introduce them, is going to talk on this issue of how the process of G7 is going to go. So let me just get down to introducing our panelists because you've had me before. I don't take too much time. I want to shut up and listen. We are joined today by a great uh, panel of experts, global experts. One of them is Professor Anna Katarina Honig, who is the director, German Development Institute. Germany is actually the presidency for the G7 this time around, and she'll talk to us about that. She is also a co-chair together with myself and Professor Ilona on the task for seven of the G7, which is dealing with uh, global health. We are also joined by Professor Ilona Kikbuch, who many of you know that I co-chaired UHG 2030 with, uh, one of my best runs on global health, learning from Professor Ilona and her global and global uh, health diplomacy experience. Professor Ilona is the founder and chair, Global Health Center, the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. And many of you here may be her students as well. Uh, I am also joined today, or uh, we are going to be joined shortly uh, by Professor Hasbula Tabrani, the lead chair of the Task Force 6 on Global Health Security and COVID-19 from Indonesia. He is not here yet, but Professor Tabrani is going to be joining us, hopefully. But with us here is Professor Olive Shisana. Professor Shisana, is a president and CEO of Evidence-Based Solutions, but Professor Shisana is also an, a senior advisor to Professor Cyril Ramaphosa, to President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa, and also a well-known uh, global uh, gender equality advocate. And of course, we are joined again by Professor Srinath Reddy, President, Public Health Foundation of India. And of course, I did introduce my co-hosts, uh, Edwin Masharia, Global Managing Partner, Dalberg Advisors. Welcome all, 154 full house. And I know we'll be joined by more people, but this is now my moment to introduce Professor Anna Katarina Honig to quickly share with us or summarize a brief overview of the T7 Task Force, the G7, and why the G7, and why this conversation. Over to you, Professor Anna Katarina. Thank you, Dr. Kichinji Gitali. Thank you very much for the kind invitation also to Edwin uh, Macharia, as well as, of course, also to Desta Lako to, for putting this event together. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be with you here today. Um, we are turning today towards the G7. We look at uh, one of the global club governance formats that has been um, um, developing or um, in, in the past or being practiced over the past centuries. Um, it, is, it is bringing together, as you have already said, um, uh, Getinji, the, the seven largest, biggest economies of, of the world um, in order to um, reflect on, on each time sort of a number of usually structural big policy issues. And this year, um, we have taken over at the 1st of January, the presidency, 
Germany took over the presidency from the UK um, for one year before we then handed over to Japan. Um, so we are challenged or ta uh, tasked with, um, with the ambition to um, guide, guide us, guide um, the, the world, contribute through the G7 platform to um, leaving the pandemic behind us, as you've um, pointed out already. This is uh, one of the core elements. Um, and at the same time, of course, also continue with a number of, um, of focal areas that the G7 had already taken up under the UK presidency. Um, one of those is, for instance, um, substantial investments into infrastructures, transregional infrastructures, um, also in the collaboration with um, with with Africa, um, I would like to simply point to the five main areas that the German G7 uh, presidency identified as action areas, um, and then say a few more words on how the G7 tries to mobilize in order to be advised. Um, out of different uh, civil society and scientific um, perspectives. Now, for this year, the, the German G7 seven presidency put an emphasis on five focal areas. They are um, one, a sustainable planet. So here basically um, uh, continuing the work of combating climate change as well as um, biodiversity loss. Second is um, economic stability and transformation. Here very much the idea of economic recovery and of using the um, COVID-19 stimulus packages in a um, green transformative manner um, stands at the center. Here we also see the continuation of the infrastructural um, discussions that were being brought up during the UK presidency. The third area is healthy lives or is entitled healthy lives. That's where um, pandemic preparedness and uh, vaccine equities inequities stand at the foreground um, of, of the priority program. The fourth area is investments in a better future. Here we see um, also the infrastructure focus, but also a strong focus on um, on rethinking um, the international trade system as well as financial instruments uh, on the multilateral level. And fifth, um, Stronger Together is the title here. It focuses on rethinking actually or um, facing the challenges of our multilateral system, the UN, as well as especially here the Security Council, but also the different club governance formats. So that was the program that was put up um, early, earlier this year. Now, we all know that um, moving out of the pandemic, as well as climate change, were um, sort of regarded as the overarching um, challenges. A third one has arisen since then, and that is the, um, is the invasion of Russia into in, in Ukraine. Um, and with this, um, an open, um, open, brutal war in the middle of Europe that is, of course, um, um, overshadowing substantially also some of the discussions now within the G7 context. Now, uh, in order to um, be able to reflect on these focal, these five focal areas um, by building on the advice from different societal sectors, there are the so-called engagement groups being put together, such as Think7, bringing, for instance, all think tanks and expertise from think tanks um, from all uh, seven uh, G7 countries and beyond together. Um, but there's also Women Seven, for instance, bringing together representative um, groups that, that organize, mobilize for, for women rights, civil, soci civil society groups, civil, si civil Seven, I'm sorry, Business Seven, um, et cetera. No? So the idea is to bring together um, the expertise from different societal, um, societal groups in order to um, also here draw on the expertise and also get a bit of a feedback, the political level of some feedback on how um, the different topics are being discussed. 
Um, we were mandated from the, the German Development Institute that I'm director of together with the Global Solutions Initiative to um, organize, to coordinate the Think7 process um, in which we now have also five task forces around these five um, priority areas. And today we are here coming together um, in the task force of global health that um, is being headed by um, Yetinji Itahi, Ilona Kikbush and myself. Um, so thank you very much for, for making this possible again, um, Yetinji. And um, while we organize these um, this, this, over, this overall process of bringing th the expertise of think tanks from all over the world, but mainly focused on um, the C7, G7 countries, simply because it is immediately advising the uh, G7. Um, we also pay attention to build the bridge um, to the G20. You know? um, and how do we do this? Um, we do it through a number of um, methods, basically, or instruments. With um, the, the G20 has also a Think20 um, advisory process. This Think20 process has an advisory board that we I'm part of. Um, we bring, uh, we invite a um, number of, um, or we facilitate the continuous dialogue between, between the Think7 process as well as the Think20 process. And due to this, I'm also very um, happy and excited that Professor Hasbulla uh, could join us here today from speaking for the global health related discussions within the Think20 um, process. Now, um, maybe let me just finish. Um, with this overview over the overall um, process by saying within the task force of global health, we explicitly said there is no sense in basically organizing an advisory process by drawing only on the expertise and the limited expertise within the G7 countries. Yeah, especially the, within a global pandemic situation. I mean, it has shown to us in, in such a tangible manner how crucial it is to overcome also the, um, the to overcome this pandemic only jointly. That's the only possibility we have. And doing this um, by already overcoming basically or structuring transregional dialogues um, across the across the different continents and not within, not facilitating it mainly within um, a G7 or only a G20 in different club governance uh, formats. Yeah? So I'm, I'm really excited that we um, could here within the Global Health Task Force um, assure that we immediately um, let the whole discussion process in a, in a trans-regional manner. And um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to your comments, the different remarks, comments that you have with regard to the issue paper that Ilona Kikbush uh, will now present. What is the issue paper? Basically, it's a collection of the different um, the different policy recommendations that the overall task force um, has come up with in um, by now around 20 policy briefs. They can be um, looked at on the www.think7.org. That's where the, the policy briefs are published. Um, but we have now compiled these in an issue paper um, and, and Ilona will introduce them to you but really with, with, the, with the interest to get your insights, your perspectives, your criticism, your critical feedback in order to push our thinking a little further and also push the action, the policy action on the level of the G7 um, then um, later on. Last sentence, this issue paper will be um, finalized basically in the coming weeks and depend uh, based on also your comments, remarks, um, feedback. And it will be submitted to the G7, um, here then represented by the Chancellor Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, um, Scholz in um, mid-June. But before that, uh, the, the actual subject content, the recommendations will also be discussed with 
um, the, the health ministry and with representatives of the development ministry and other ministries within the German context, as well as with the round of Sherpa of, um, of all G7 countries, uh, those, those um, yeah, civil servants that are in charge of organizing the overall G7 negotiations. Thank you. And Thank I hand you. over back to you, Gitinji. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Anna Katarina, for that background. I want to recognize that uh, Professor Hasbola Tabrani, lead chair for the task force, has just joined us as a panelist. We are now going to go yeah. forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome, Professor. We are going to go forward to Professor Ilona, who will summarize the key recommendations of this G7 paper on global health and other issues. And we'll then be looking forward to hear the response or the discussions from the panelists on what they think about these recommendations. And also looking forward to the audience's views on chat. Thank you. And now over to you, Professor Ilona. Thank you very much, Gitinji. And thank you very much also for accepting the invitation we gave you to be our co-chair, uh, because we felt very strongly, and none of the other task forces have done this, I might add, uh, that if we discuss global health, uh, we need a voice from the low and middle income countries. Our recommendations, of course, are towards the G7 countries that they should take responsibility. You already indicated, of course, their economic strength. You uh, indicated their strong contribution to overseas development assistance, etc. Uh, but of course, also it's uh, their politics that make a difference. And uh, since uh, at least one of the really big powers is part of the G7, uh, this becomes uh, particularly important. We were also uh, influenced by the fact that Germany, uh, until recently, until the United States came back to WHO, was the largest donor to uh, the WHO, that Germany is the country that over the last years has supported global health considerably and uh, has also suggested that the assessed contributions of, to the World Health Organization be significantly increased and uh, they've been fighting this fight for quite some time. It was interesting, Anna Katrina alluded to it, that of course, everyone in Europe, many of the big policy uh, drivers are very much influenced by the war in Ukraine. But still just a couple of weeks ago when uh, the Global Solutions Summit came together in Berlin and the chancellor spoke, one third of his speech was about global health. It was quite extraordinary. And so one of the things uh, Germany is also trying to do as far as we are informed is not to let the global health agenda disappear uh, totally. So this is part uh, also of, uh, of this uh, overall uh, challenge. Uh, Anna Katrina has also mentioned uh, the various timelines we have another one that uh, there is a meeting of health ministers and the meeting of development ministers between the 18th and the 20th of May. The health ministers are consciously meeting just before the World Health Assembly. So uh, we also hope to make our material, particularly the issue paper that we're discussing here, available to the health ministers to have as a background uh, for their work. So the first slide here refers to uh, some of the challenges. One of course uh, is that uh, the need for a peaceful democratic and secure world order that also relates and Germany has underlined that in its G7 uh, work, you know, how do we want multilateralism to look at this point in time? How can it guarantee a peaceful and secure world order? And what do these seven countries that are democracies have to contribute? Then of course, the interrelated challenges, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, basically they are accelerated and there is, as we say in our paper, no back to normal. 
we are living the normal is crises and interrelated crises. And I think we all have to be able uh, to respond to that because only depending how you count, seven or eight years remain uh, to reach uh, the sustainable development goal. And during the pandemic, we've seen how at least uh, life expectancy has decreased, global poverty has increased, health inequity has grown, and we're just, you know, maybe already at the beginning of a global hunger crisis. So part of what our paper argues is that the G7 would actually need to help develop a new approach that actually doesn't look at issue by issue by issue, but actually tries to bring about the fragmentation of issues together in terms of global health, try to address the increasing fragmentation of the global health architecture. Every time we have a crisis in global health, we propose a new fund, a new organization, a new setup. How actually should we address that? And of course, uh, that the G7 must uh, stand for an inclusive approach. Obviously, it's legitimate for a group uh, to say, you know, where do we as a group, as a political club want to go? But the overall goal must be to promote an inclusive approach with all countries. And Anna Katrina has alluded to that in terms of, you know, reaching out to the G7, reaching out to the UN system, etc. One of the things we also looked at critically is that uh, every time you know a G7 or a G20 meeting comes along, the presidency sets new goals and new priorities. And we felt looking at 2030 and having seven members of the G7, it would actually be quite nice if the G7 came up with a seven year priority plan. We called it a global health compact, which would allow each of them to have a presidency within that and uh, actually move the world forward to 2030. And we've said it must be informed by values, sustained investment, and global solidarity structures that lead to equity and access. So if we look at the values, um, we uh, feel strongly uh, the commitment to multilateralism and the strengthening of I'm never quite happy with the term global health architecture, but uh, let's leave it. And uh, meaningful partnerships and exchange. Again, we're not all happy with the term global south, uh, but it's trying to express this needs to be an inclusive uh, approach. Uh, that the G7 who's created some of this fragmented architecture should actually try and bring it together that it should be much more committed to financing global public health goods uh, in an integral manner than continuing the vertical funding. And of course, it should fully support WHO both financially and politically. That of course means significant investments. We've looked at you know, the outstanding vaccine pledges made by the G7, but even more generally, you know, fulfill the commitments already made before you add a whole other bunch. And of course, also look at what has possibly changed. Gitinji, you alluded to it, that uh, vaccines alone is not the issue now. Uh, there's a whole range of, of other issues, particularly last mile delivery and sustainable infrastructures and of course resources and personnel in order to move forward. So we've also felt that this call for better infrastructures that the G7 has put forward should absolutely 150% apply to uh, health infrastructures, primary healthcare, UHC, uh, public health. And it should be an infrastructure for a knowledge sharing economy uh, you all know that no matter, you know, I've mentioned many of the things Germany has contributed in global health, 
but it has been part of the EU consensus uh, to actually speak out against uh, intellectual change, you know, applying the TRIPS waiver at the World Trade Organization. So there's two sides uh, to uh, this picture. And we feel very strongly about this knowledge sharing economy, which also has new dimensions in relation uh, to uh, the digital transformation and health data. We do not want to see data extraction uh, from the low and middle income countries to serve, for example, research needs uh, in the developed countries. We've tried to differentiate a bit between short, immediate and long term <coughs> priorities. And you can see them on the next slide. No, there's one missing. <coughs> Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, just excuse me. Okay, I'm back. So of course, priority to address equity, and this is particularly related <coughs> to vaccine and the pandemic. The second is really to strengthen multilateral health governance and investment in global public goods. And you can see a particularly focus here on the ACT Accelerator. And we also suggest to establish a new ministerial level priority infrastructure task force to look particularly at the uh, health infrastructure that I've referred to. Next slide, please. The other implementations are to address the fragmentation of the global health system. And here, <coughs> we feel strongly that there should be an interagency standing committee for global health uh, to help improve coordination. We cannot have a competitive global health marketplace of the kind we have today uh, in terms also of the um, financial resources that are really available and to have various global health uh, uh, organizations compete with each other on this global marketplace. We feel this has to be organized in a new way around global public goods financing. And uh, as I've already indicated, we want the G7 to engage in a very strong a trans regional dialogue uh, to take their thinking forward. As the group of major donors, they should not be uh, pushing their donor priorities on other countries, but should be uh, moving forward in an integrated and partnership oriented way. We've also suggested that in the long term, uh, but to be established now, the G7 needs to take up planetary health issues, the interface of health uh, and climate and environment, and there has not yet been a health and environment ministers meeting. You know, we had the progress of health and foreign ministers meetings, of health and development ministers, of health and finance ministers, but not with environment ministers. And we're suggesting that this be taken forward and then also moved into uh, the Japanese presidency. And of course, we feel very strongly about investing in science scientific and pharmaceutical innovation. We need totally new types of partnerships uh, in research and uh, help a low and middle income countries on the one hand to build their research and development capacities. But also on the other hand, if we look at uh, some of the middle income countries who have made such progress in research, in digital transformation uh, and uh, other areas that uh, it is time that the G7 recognize the enormous progress that has taken, uh, uh, that has happened in so many of the middle income countries, but also innovation in low income countries in the whole area of health, mobile health and other areas. There is not enough two way learning and this is also our intention with this meeting. It is two-way learning, and we want to listen particularly to you. 
Thank you very much. And sorry for the coughing. <clears throat> <laughs> no problem at all, Ilona. Very clearly delivered. And uh, it's very clear. We have a lot of work and this issue paper, which has been presented by Professor Ilona, looking at many, many things, collective approaches, new approach, addressing fragmentation, the global health compact, a longer term compact rather than year on year presidency, this framework of values, investment and the transformation. There is a call to address equity, global public goods and alignment between organized development aid and the public goods, and also addressing this fragmentation, which we all experience. Many of the, of the people on this panel will know that we deal with Gavi, we deal with Global Fund, then they are all competing, there's this replenishment, there's this other replenishment, and how do we align this kind of financing and a call for an interagency committee to assist on global health, to assist with more alignment within, within the global health, uh, especially because as I said, 8% of organized development aid, the money that goes to Global Fund, the money that goes to Gavi, the money that goes to all these international structures that were established alongside the MDGs, 80% of that largely comes from this G7. So we cannot ignore the G7 in trying to restructure how the global uh, health systems um, uh, move forward. And of course, uh, this whole agenda of investing in R&D and planetary health task force. I would like now to come down to our panelists, our discussants, to discuss this paper presented by, by Ilona. I would like to ask that I start with Professor Reddy Trinath, because of course, um, I know Professor um, uh, Tabrani has just joined. I want to give him a few more minutes to take a breath. Uh, but I would like to ask, Professor Reddy, could you kindly give us your views on this issue paper, the G7, its relevance, and what you think that this paper, the co-chairs of this task force should really focus on? Over to you, Professor Reddy. Uh, thank you very much. And I thank Ilona also for that excellent paper, which really provides a great opportunity to discuss the very many ramifications of global health, not only in the context of COVID, but also in terms of what the future needs are taking, of course, the lessons of our experiences from COVID. One of the elements that I would like to raise is related to how best can we define global health equity. We do require equity within countries and across countries, with or without a public health emergency. Because unless you have efficient, equitable, and empathetic health systems functioning all through in a reliable manner in the steady state, we will not be able to provide for a swift, strong and sustained surge response when challenged with a public health emergency. So this is not something that can be created immediately as an instantaneous reaction, but it has to be a sustained effort. And there, I believe equity also demands that you have to have engagement of multiple perspectives, which provide accurate assessment of the needs and can chart out the potential impact of actions across the world. Therefore, there are very many voices that need to be heard. The G7 are very influential actors, and I believe our immediate attempt is to attract their attention gain resources, and also ensure that they continue their commitment. However, we need to ensure that they hear many voices from across the world. And that becomes absolutely important for an equitable provision of services within and across countries. And this is where the question comes in is, how widely can the consultations go in a relatively short time frame? We don't necessarily want to crowd the agenda dilute the discussions and delay action as a result. Nevertheless, when we are stating that we are building a consultative mechanism and also creating platforms for very speedy action. And when we talk, for example, of an interagency standing committee for global health, is it only global health agencies that are going to be part of it? Where is the rest of the UN coming into the picture? When we're talking about planetary health, how are we going to bring the environment into it? As even Ilona said, 
where is the discussion between health and environment? But there are multiple other UN agencies that are going to be involved in trade, in, in uh, investments, whether it's the World Bank or the World Trade Organization and others, how are we bringing in the rest of the UN compact into this? At some stage, we have to actually define our relationships there without, as I said, delaying or diluting action. The second element is, at least we must ensure that other agencies are not acting at cross purposes uh, when we are trying to build. And this becomes very important in terms of sustainable environmental solutions that we are not acting at cross purposes, whether in food and agriculture systems or in terms of infrastructure or in terms of transport or in terms of investments for that matter. So therefore bringing in a wider platform for monitoring is going to be important. Establishing capacity for health impact assessment is going to be very important. Again, not very elaborate studies which will take years to complete, but fairly quick assessments. If the G7 takes these actions, if any members of the G7 take these actions, uh, or if they support actions for other countries in a particular manner, what will be the overall impact on health, environment, sustainable development, and on global health equity? So we do need those quick assessments to inform action and to build in safeguards and perhaps even to apply some necessary breaks if they're going on the wrong track. So that's going to be an important element as well, which I see uh, has to be uh, looked at. Then comes the question of uh, intergenerational equity. We are talking about a seven year time frame. Certainly we need to focus on that. But the consequences of the actions taken during these seven years are going to cast a long shadow or light up the path of the future generations. And those voices need to be heard when we're talking about future of health equity or the future of this planet. How are we bringing those into conversations? Because one of the problems of course is going to be that some of the elements that we will be talking about now will have definitely a relatively national interest first type of approach. But the younger generation is more unified in looking at the impact on their generation as a whole. And they are likely to believe more in global solidarity than unfortunately people who are entrenched in national interests. And how do we actually engage them in those conversations? Lastly, I find in an excellent document, one element I would like to see some strengthening, further strengthening is related to, uh, in terms of uh, investing in science and pharmaceutical innovation. There's a lot of discussion in this on innovation and ensuring that we have the products of science advanced for betterment of health and health equity. But health equity will not be served only by production of new uh, devices or drugs or new innovations. We have to ensure access, affordability, and ensure that proprietary science does not interfere either with access or affordability. When we talk about intellectual property rights and the inability of developing countries to access vaccines or drugs, then those can be problematic, even if there are excellent innovations. Uh, but just to revisit again, the global architecture, we are asking for WHO to be strengthened while at the same time saying that we have to have the 20th century institutions which are out of date cast aside. How do we only look at extra resourcing for WHO without giving it far greater freedom as well as accountability and how does the General Assembly of uh, the countries who are member states decide the priorities of WHO as opposed to this global implementation task force that we are talking about, uh, this interagency standing committee? Will WHO have its arm twisted by the interagency standing committee or will the General Assembly, which is much more representative of the developing countries, even if, though the health ministers may not have much of a uh, influence on other sectors, but at least in health, they can take a position. How do we ensure that that particular role of the General Assembly of WHO is not undermined, 
even as we bring in the global agencies together into a, a common platform. So some of these issues need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Reddy, with, uh, because of your clarity of mind in terms of these issues and uh, you brought in many factors I don't have to go back to, uh, but one of the ones I know clearly is intergenerational equity. I think that's something we really need to pay attention to alongside everything else you've said. And I've, of course, I continue to see comments. We have uh, people commenting on, you know, where is the role of women and, or where is the place for women and girls in this, in this conversation to the G7? Where is the place for mental health uh, in this conversation? So I would now like to ask Professor Shisana to give her discussion on Professor Ilona's uh, presentation. Over to you, Professor Shisana. Well, let me start by saying thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ilona. You still remain very, very active after so many years of being in public health. That's just wonderful. Um, it's a very good paper, very good start. Let me start by saying that because for the first time, it focus, it's focusing on the question of global health. You would recall that Dr. Gro Brundtland had been trying for more than 30 years you know, to say, can the heads of state focus on public health? Because they are always focusing on everything else, economy, finance, and everything else. Health has always been something that is seriously neglected. So first of all, I'm glad with the fact that there is a focus, you know, on health from the G7. What I have a question about, is whether they are going to be running this as G7 or as uh, Professor Reddy has already said, are they going to be running it as part and parcel of the G20, which is trying to set up a health and um, finance and health task force, which also has got very serious limitations because it does not include the low and middle income countries. Now, if they are putting together this global health because of the pandemic that, you know, it has spared them to really focus on that, there are some really good documents globally already that are agreeing in terms of governance of such a structure. And that governance includes, you know, the United Nations, includes WHO, includes, you know, ensuring that there is a balance between those that have money and those that do not have money. It doesn't mean that if you have a lot of resources, you can be able to dictate to the world in terms of what should happen because the recipient has got the choice of whether to even accept what it is that is being done. And that's what I like about the paper because it's laying it out clearly, the importance of the low and middle income countries you know, to participate in that. So even if they come up with the health compact, you know, with all those priorities, which obviously are going to include universal access, you know, to healthcare, which will benefit women, will benefit children, will benefit those communities. It will still be important to ensure that there is some governance that's actually acceptable. Political legitimacy is quite critical. And I think the paper should focus a lot more on that political legitimacy, particularly with respect to the question of trust. We saw what happened when uh, COVID vaccine, before COVID vaccines, everybody was one. There was solidarity around the world. We all talked as one, leave no one behind. All of these terms that of equity and all that. And we kept asking questions, what is this equity? What do they mean by equity? immediately the vaccines were available, bang, everything turned around. Everyone was looking at their own country. They were now vaccinating everyone, getting boosters in their own country before some of the countries could even get a little bit of that, that vaccine. The low and middle income countries were left behind. Even though at the beginning, everyone said, you know, we're never going to get rid of this virus unless everyone else is able to access the countermeasures. Countermeasures were not there for Africa. Even today, we are seeing the consequences of that because the first world was able to get vaccines and vaccinate its people quickly when people were still afraid of this thing that they didn't know what it was. 
you know, this virus that was new. Now, when you look at in Africa, they've already seen what it is that uh, not everybody is going to die. So they are not motivated anymore to really get vaccines. So we're struggling with vaccine uptake. But if we had received vaccines right at the beginning, when this pandemic started, today will be at the same level of 60 to 65 percent of vaccination rates. So that is a really big problem. The other thing that I really liked in your paper is that uh, you talk about you know, the TRIPS waiver in terms of technology transfer. You know, we agree that it is very important to have technology transfer in order to be able to produce the vaccines, the diagnostics, the therapeutics, you know, and, and whatever is needed as a countermeasure. The unfortunate part that I'm seeing is that when they actually go to WTO to go and discuss this, the EU is the first one, including the United States, to say, no, we're not going to have the TRIPS waiver that is going to allow you even to deal with the question of, vac of diagnostics and therapeutics. So that is an issue that I think needs to be highlighted a lot more strongly in the paper. Finally, I just want to say that on the question of Act A, I, in a, in a position of uh, co-chairing Act A at a technical level, the president chairs it together with the, the prime minister of Norway. We would be the first ones to say that Act A's time probably should be over by September because we cannot continue with a structure that represents 33 countries when there are so many other countries that are part and parcel of the United Nations, part and parcel of WHO, that should be playing a critical role in terms of determining how to deal with We're Especially you, if, yes, you're back now. Sorry, we are lost for us to a open up, place a new structure that would be that would have mechanisms. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. My my internet is it okay now? Now we can hear you clearly. Can you and hear me now? Very, and you're making a very important point about the act A and whether it should continue or not. And we missed a bit there. Could you just repeat that? It's really critical. Three countries. The council represents about 33 countries. And we've got a huge number at the United Nations level, at WHO level. So the governance of such a pandemic preparedness structure must actually be open and allow every country to have a voice. Give a country voice, whether it's low and middle income countries, whether it's high income countries, we must all be sitting together have a forum that will be able to give guidance in terms of where the world is supposed to go in terms of pandemic preparedness. So I do not think that Act A is a right instrument for really being taken forward as a, a global architecture. It's okay, it was set up under emergency. It has done a fantastic job. I could go on and recite all the brilliant things that it has done in terms of vaccine access, in terms of you know, therapeutics in terms of diagnostics and so forth, or health systems connect, I could tell you that, but I'm not sure that this is the right way to actually keep that uh, institution the way it is. So I'm going to stop right there to give other people an opportunity to make input. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Prof. And, uh, and again, for being so clear on what, and what needs to be retained and what needs to go and being courageous on calling out also where there is underrepresentation. I would now like to um, ask the final panelist or discussant of this paper, and that is Professor Hasbola Tabrani to comment on the presentation and give his views. Professor Tabrani, we are really glad to have you uh, from Indonesia and um, we appreciate your presence here. Over to you for about six minutes of your comments. And then after that, I'll hand over to Edwin Macharia to take us through the next session. Over to you, Professor Tabrani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gitani. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ilona, for the excellent uh, thinking of this concept of this uh, uh, 
papers. Um, I'm very much like to uh, comment on the global public health, global public good equity solidarity issues that it is part of the um, missing link of the global health system at this time. We've been focusing on the uh, improvement of the uh, medical technology um, research, but um, equitable issues still uh, lag behind. Um, equity, in, in my view, is a, a key to in make everybody inclusive, uh, get their healthcare they need. However, we cannot, we cannot promise or push that everybody should get healthcare as the whole concept of the healthcare is needed. Uh, we know there's um, limited resources and we know for the uh, uh, USC 2030 is only eight years uh, more from now. It is very short time uh, for this a very big concept. And therefore, I'm thinking that we have to uh, put some priority narrowing on what issue that this universal health coverage, universal access, equitable access, inclusiveness for what kind of health. Um, and thinking that we have to define uh, clearly uh, the basic healthcare needs that must be accessible to all of people in this planet. Um, uh, what is the essential or the basic health need that um, it's essential to make the productivity of the people, essential to prevent uh, contagious disease or spread of uh, health hazard to other countries, other people, COVID already gave us a lesson. If we look at the COVID distribution, COVID-19 starts in um, middle-income countries. Start in China, um, the, the Delta variant start in India, the uh, Omicron start in uh, South Africa, but the high-income countries suffer uh, very much. If we look at the uh, global GDP, uh, the most suffered by uh, economic suffering is by the, uh, the G7. Uh, and therefore, we have to uh, bring this uh, as part of the evidence to most of the leaders in G7 and G20 um, that we have learned from COVID. During this COVID, uh, two years to COVID, everybody, regardless of their background, they have healthcare background or no healthcare background. They talk about health. They talk about uh, um, COVID. They talk about the importance of correlation between health and economies as whole. So this is the opportunity that we uh, should bring to the table that look, this healthcare has a very big impact. Uh, this paper already, Ilona, thanks, uh, illustrate three point. Uh, 2 percent GDP loss. 3.2 percent GDP loss is about three trillion US dollar. It's huge, huge money. If we, we if we can prevent them by having 300 billion dollar, that's uh, ten times more. That's already very, very, um, very good success. The problem then, uh, how do we ensure that uh, there are enough money? Sorry uh, to say I. I'm focusing on this financing and two issue of this to ensure equity. How this global public health uh, be financed? I agree that WHO need to be strengthened. WHO need to be a restructure probably in, in a way that WHO could finance and also assist uh, low middle income countries how to strengthen their system, how to uh, prevent their system from uh, having um, destruction in uh, at, le at, at least in surveilling, detecting health risks in their countries um, and curing uh, essential um, health needs that ensure that people could uh, get uh, productivity increase. So in this situation, uh, we need to strengthen the system, 
uh, the system can be developed if the system in the country, the health system in the country, and also uh, the global system has adequate human resources that capable of diagnosing current situation, current situation in healthcare, not only the healthcare system, but also interrelated between healthcare, economics, environments, industries, uh, politically. So that need to be strengthened. If we could build uh, adequate human resources in low middle, in the, in middle income countries to do this diagnostic of the system and assess the system designing of health reform that uh, in the end will meet the um, global uh, health, that healthy health, health system uh, assisting each other uh, to prevent uh, serious disease, serious uh, health threats uh, spread of all the countries, that will be very, very, uh, uh, very good. The key issue is that, that we need to discuss uh, eight years, very, very short time, uh, convincing all the leaders in G7, G20, uh, to come up with a consensus might take one or two years. Uh, in the report, probably as a think tank, um, we have to do, um, think not only the how to improve the health system, how to communicate effectively with the government leaders, with leaders of both G7, G20. I think this must be um, elaborated a little bit more, maybe not in the paper, maybe among us uh, discuss how we make sure. It is probably uh, Prof. Sishana mentioning as political, yeah, uh, because without that political pressure, uh, but really effective, not only just, you know, a declaration, something like that, uh, without any follow up, you know, we remember we have a declaration of Alma Ata in the 70, in the early 70, but until now primary care still uh, very lag behind. For example, how do we make this effective uh, of this uh, situation uh, to the government leadership in their meeting? I think the last one that I would like to emphasize is the um, how the issue of how uh, we make this public global uh, private uh, partnership become a workable partnership. Uh, what is the right mix between public and private? What is work of in the private sector and work in the public sector with what is, doesn't work can be also uh, identified and um, build understanding on that issue. So both uh, sector could be strengthening each other rather than competing each other. I think I stop there, Tete uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Very good reflections uh, on the how and uh, the issue about, again, the human reason for health, without whom there is no uh, health system and uh, looking at an expanded view of human resources uh, beyond just health sector, you know, environment and all these other areas. And now I would like to actually hand over to um, my co-host, Edwin Masharia, to run us through the next uh, 25 minutes or so. And I think he might request for 10 minutes more, depending on how <laughs> this goes. Over to you, Edwin. That, that's what happens when you get great people uh, having a conversation. But more importantly, which we do not see happen as often, is people being willing to come and say, here's a perspective, help, help us make it better. And so for everybody who's in the audience, please share any thoughts, reactions, comments, feedback uh, in the chat group or in the Q&A, because it is important uh, that this becomes a better document uh, and a better advocacy tool for all of us going forward, uh, rather than just hearing what is being proposed. And then we, we think, we, I wish we had the opportunity to help shape it or change it as we go along. And doing that actually takes a lot of courage. And so thank you to everybody who's been part of the G7 Think Group by coming in and saying, this is what we know, this is what we've, we've put together, help us make it stronger and better. So it really has impact. And in the same way, thank you for making sure Dr. Gedenji is part of that task force uh, and bringing that Global South view. I think we do need to be really be proactive in making sure we bring appropriate voices to the fore.
I'll begin off with a couple of questions uh, for respective members of the panel. Um, uh, and then anybody else who has additional questions, put them in, the, there are some in the Q&A already uh, and some in the chat group will try and involve them. Let me start with you, Anna Katerina and, uh, and Ilona, because in some ways we've all seen the meetings that happen and the fantastic press release that comes out that says there's dedication of tens or hundreds of billions of dollars to X or Y or Z. And then usually we don't quite know what happens after. Right? This is an opportunity to actually help influence what goes into that meeting. But there's always that question of how can we, in some ways, give us homework of how can we make sure that the commitments that are being made actually translate to real things on the ground and actually shifting uh, the arc of, uh, of global health going forward. Any thoughts, comments, or sometimes things you would want the audience to help you shape that thinking of what happens after the G7 meeting going forward? So that's the first question. Well, maybe, thanks. I, I just um, kickstart us and, and I'm sure Ilona will, will then take over. Um, I mean, I've been reading the, the messages in the chat and would like to very much express my thanks for, for these um, many, um, many aspects where I would say, yes, definitely we need to emphasize these um, more in the paper, take them in. Um, Others, others are potentially already discussed in, in um, some of the policy briefs, but um, yeah, did, did not make it, so to say, into the issue paper. And here I would like to put my finger in briefly. Um, when we, when we um, had the, I think it's about 20, only 10 of them are published so far, but there's another 10 roughly in the pipeline being published in the coming week or so. Um, when we put them in front of us and had, um, many different um, recommendations we had to of course cluster and we also tried to um, ask ourselves which of these recommendations really address the g7 which address regional bodies asean european union african union which of these address national level um, national governments or uh, the WHO, for instance. Uh, so, and we sort, sorted them out and, and said, well, we need to, because we need to make sure that whatever we put in front of, um, of the G7 can also be heard to some degree. Um, so, so we really um, sift through and said, okay, let's, let's identify um, those uh, four to five areas um, where, where the G7 has to mobilize political leadership, political will in order to drive processes forward and not for the G7 only because that was also a remark yeah, or for um, the G20 only, but globally on the global level um, and basically facilitate also the dialogue processes then on a number of other levels that, um, that uh, push basically or encourage political will formation um, also on national levels, but but really, where where is the G seven? Where can the G seven take take Venus on in a driver's seat? Um, the second aspect we considered was what you know, sort of thinking it through out of a short term, mid term, long term perspective. What are the activities that have to be done now? And um, these are in many ways those that had already been promised also. Last, uh, last year by under the UK presidency, um, where it's really about fulfilling already made promises, which is not only important in order to simply fulfill these promises themselves, but also for general legitimacy of the G7 in, in total. And, and it's about credibility, of course, that is crucial for the overall multilateral system. So also here we sort of try to distinguish short, mid, long-term perspectives and um, have to really see here that at the moment the, the, the war in the Ukraine is overshadowing the, the short-term discussions. No? So we see a substantial move towards focusing on short-term coping activities with regard, um, with regard to the war and its trans-regional expected effects, some of them we know already. Um, and then third, also the question on G7, G20. Of course, we, we, real, we all realize that um, Indonesia is, is 
is really doing an admirable job um, with the G20 presidency under a not easy condition. Um, and this is the second aspect of it that we really question how much the G20 at the moment can move, um, move discussions forward. Um, given the, the the considerations whether Russia will basically be part of the of the G7 20 summit, which role is going to be um, played by Russia, which how do, how do basically the other countries um, uh, reflect, and is there um, is this is this risk of of the G20 20 being divided into into two um, two groups? Um, is that how does that reflect on the field of global health? No? Um, so, so there, I think we have a situation. Maybe uh, Professor Hasbulla can can comment a little more on this. Um, we have a situation where the G7 also um, is challenged with the responsibility to to um, co-think um, the the. Yeah, the, the blockage, the potential potential blockage within the G20 at the moment. Ilona, would you like to come in? So many. many yeah, I'll many just make one remarks. or two additional comments. One is uh, to underline what Anna Katrina said that um, we uh, try to be very conscious that the G7 is a political body. Uh, so it's not a technical body. And we also already saw with all the uh, uh, policy briefs and their recommendations that some of them, you know, started to become very, very, very technical. And one would have seen them rather, let's be simplistic, in a WHO context than in a G7 context. So, you know, that's, that's one thing we, we, we try to address. The other thing we really try to address, and I'm so thankful for the comments of the panel which help us do that, is how must the G7 reform itself? You know, so much, you know, just a year ago, just think of the Trump years. People said the G7, you know, close it down. Who wants it? It can't do anything. And, uh, and now there is a feeling uh, these seven democracies should be doing something. They carry a tremendous responsibility, but, 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 and you've said all of the buts, you know, they're not here to run the world, thank you very much. Uh, they're here to take the responsibility they should, which they have not done uh, during the pandemic. And that's very, very, very clear, despite the fact that many of them gave a lot of money, that's true, but you know, if you take the whole package, uh, and uh, Olive has you know, alluded to that very clearly, they have not fulfilled their responsibility in the global system. And that is, you know, so how must the G7 reform itself? Then in that context, we tried this focus on how can it help reform the global health architecture? And again, I want to thank you, you know, for the comments, particularly Srinath also drew attention to some of the pitfalls. And uh, I think those are uh, in incredibly important. And then of course, uh, what uh, was important for us is, you know, in terms of finance, let's not go down a road where it's a whole range of vertical finance approaches again, but that it's financing infrastructure and human resources for health security, for universal health coverage, for a, a health workforce, for research and development. So those are, you know, some of our, you might call the macro uh, recommendations. But, you know, I see in the chat that many people say, where's NCDs, where's mental health, where's this, that, and the other. We couldn't, you know, give a recommendations to say, you know, help reform the global health architecture and fragmentation, and at the same time, then, uh, you know, give a whole set of vertical recommendations. Our feeling is, you know, if we have a universal health coverage agenda, 
and Japan will probably be pushing that very, very strongly. They've already given us that indication. And remember, you know, Gitinji and I as co-chairs of UHC 2030 are very aware how critical 2023 is at the United Nations for uh, the U, uh, uh, for universal health coverage and political commitment to that. So, you know, and, and the final thing is then, you know, how do you finance in new ways? And some of the, uh, you know, and yes, uh, people are not quite clear about the terminology. Do we say global public goods? Do we say global public goods for health? Uh, we have to go through our text again uh, to, to be uh, consistent there. So uh, I, I think that's what's driving us. And also, of course, you know, there are the other um, groups, you know, Women uh, Seven is going to make all the points that some of the colleagues in the chat made. And it's the responsibility, you know, of the overall team uh, then uh, to, to bring all this together in one big recommendation and issue paper for the heads of state. So, you know, uh, that's sort of the logic because uh, otherwise also we didn't deal with all the issues, Olive uh, referred to that, that many other of, you know, the important committees that were set up, you know, like the one chaired by uh, Sir Luke Johnson and uh, 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 Helen Clark, uh, so, you know, we didn't want to repeat things. We said, you know, where could we push something? And one of the strongest things we feel is the G7 needs to reform itself. Its role has to be clarified and definitely in, in global health. Thank you. No, fantastic, fantastic insights there. And you're exactly right. I mean, in a lot of my strategy work, uh, I know killing an institution is incredibly, incredibly hard to do, right? Once it's set up, it, it finds a way to survive forever. And so, you know, how can we bring those elements together in funding the thing that most people do not like funding, which is the core infrastructure of actually delivering service uh, on the ground? Because without that, it doesn't matter how great vaccines or therapeutics we put together, they will not get into people's bodies as, as we need to. Let me ask a question to the other three uh, individuals. I, I notice I'm the, I'm the only one who's not a doctor or a professor on this call. So I get to, I get to ask random questions, mm -hmm. but to the other three professors, uh, there was an interesting uh, infographic that was shared recently. Um, uh, and I saw it on, on, on Twitter on Dr. Gedenji's timeline uh, and I'm trying to find where it is, but it talks about global governance uh, uh, in, in health. And, and it recognized that if you look at the global health governing bodies, they're actually not globally representative. I think it's something like 75% uh, are held by nationals of high income countries, 82% uh, uh, fun in funding bodies. The US and the UK hold 51% alone. Those two countries hold 51% of all global seats in global governance for global health. Uh, and only 2.5% are held by low by nationals or low income countries. So even where the sources of decision making are happening, the sources of insight is skewed beyond the funding side. So my question to these three uh, incredible professors who I'm sure have been, uh, you know, asking exactly these questions is what needs to be done uh, to shift that mix of individuals? How do we get the three of you and others into those global governance bodies, because that's part of how we will actually change the system to be much more inclusive uh, over time. What's been your experience? Who starts? <laughs> you start, ladies first. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, my view is that um, if the values that we are suggesting for G7, relate to democracy, inclusivity, and all of that. I would imagine that they would go for a structure that's similar to, to WHO, where all countries have got a voice, but there is an executive board, like an executive structure that represents that bigger body, so that that executive structure is actually accountable you know, to all of the countries. I think if they can do that, 
then they will have to protect themselves from looking like their philanthropists who put out resources and then have to follow and say, how was that money used and for what and what and make those, you know, they really need to transform by saying, I will make money available, but once I've made that money available, it shall be governed by a democratic structure. Thank you. Professor Hasbula. Yeah, I think uh, my view is that um, the developed countries or G7 countries um, actually also have a, a diverse uh, perspective on these issues. Um, certainly the political backgrounds and uh, social cultural backgrounds has some impact on that one. Um, so in terms of the new um, global architecture or new global institution, global agency that can uh, facilitate purely more democratic decision making, I think we should uh, uh, go away from current philanthropic um, mindset, um, uh, where contribution for the uh, World Health Program, whatever the, the, the program is, um, very much uh, dominated, quote unquote, by those who contribute more. Um, I'm thinking of what the Germany, uh, the, the Chancellor of Germany, uh, one and a half centuries ago, introduced the, the, the social health insurance model, where uh, that's model, although that's mostly run in um, countries, that model where everybody contributes to a uh, according to their ability to pay. And the right of those um, benefits uh, remain equal regardless of their contribution. That model maybe uh, can be exercised more how we uh, adopt that kind of model that low income countries, uh, middle income countries get uh, a, the same uh, strong voice as the um, upper income countries. Uh, but in addition to that, we have also to um, uh, to consider that currently the human resource capacity in low and middle income countries in terms of arguing, dealing, um, ability to, to assess a more global uh, situation, more detail, uh, still need to be um, improved. Otherwise, it will not be uh, good enough uh, in uh, making um, democratic decision at the global level. I think we need to invest on that human resources again, again, um, sorry to say uh, human resources, very, very important, but investment in human resources also needs a certain funding. So maybe we have to look the way we, in, we invest or we fund a uh, program in low middle income countries from providing drugs, vaccine, whatever, um, maybe reducing a little bit and uh, concentrating in how to improve, uh, to invest in human resources in more strategic way. Thank you. Thanks. Professor Srinath, your thoughts? Uh, well, <clears throat> we have to look at both a short-term perspective and a long-term perspective. Ilona said, health is political. And politics are driven by economic considerations, commercial considerations. The reason why high-income countries are actively positioning their own technical experts in global health decision-making bodies is not only because there is a considerable degree of expertise that has been assembled over in those countries, but because quite often global health policies too are seen as important opportunities for extending political influence and commercial interests, whether it is vaccines or drugs or whatever you decide in terms of the management guidelines. So you have to make sure that the high income countries which pursue that kind of an agenda are given a very clear message that global economy is interdependent that if we have public health failures in low and middle income countries, 
the global economy will keep slipping on those banana skins of public health failures. And recognizing that interdependency, it is absolutely important that we strengthen public health structures, including scientific leadership and governance in all the countries across the world, which means there has to be a greater voice and influence of people from those countries in global decision-making bodies. That is an immediate argument to be made that if we slip up, you will slip up too. The second element of course is that we need to build capacity. We need to build a lot of capacity, therefore we need to have investment in building institutional capacity in a variety of healthcare related areas, variety of public health related areas, health administration related areas, and bring in again that competence to bring in multidisciplinary learning into health decision making. And those kind of institutions need to be fostered in developing countries while allowing a very good exchange with high income and other countries. We must also make sure that brain drain is not happening because much of what is also happening in terms of leadership in science, but even sometimes in public health in high income countries is based on borrowed talent. We must recognize and respect the talent exists in every country. Certainly some of the countries in the high income country group have provided us great benefits of the knowledge that they have created. But at the same time, the low and middle income countries are not bereft of talent. And that talent must be fostered to serve the entire world, not only the political and commercial interests of some sections of the world. Amen to that. In other ways, the, the, the people on this call are, are an example of great talent that continues to shape the world. Uh, so let me say thank you again to uh, everybody who's contributed, all our panelists. Uh, again, it takes, it takes courage to come to a forum and say, we have a perspective, would love your support in making it better. Uh, and so thanks to everybody who has shared their thoughts, their feedback in the chat. Uh, if, uh, I assume through the think7.org website, you can look at all the other policy papers, you can give your thoughts and feedback there. I've seen a couple of people suggest that they would love to be included in, in some of that thinking, uh, and they've shared their email addresses, those can be picked up and utilized. But for everybody, look at the website uh, and give your thoughts and comments there, because this is your opportunity to be a critical part of this discussion. Uh, and having been in this space for two decades plus, this doesn't happen very often, right? Usually what we see is declarations from other places and what will happen in our ecosystems versus folks who say, we have a view, we need your help to make it better. And so this is your window to do that. Uh, but before I close, let me turn over to you back, Dr. Gedenji, for your final thoughts and comments. Uh, but thanks panelists, thanks for the participants uh, and look forward to taking this forward. Dr. G. Wow, uh, what a rich conversation. I don't think that anybody can do any justice by adding anything to what has been discussed. It's been really fantastic. I take away that no level of peer reviewed research can replace lived experiences. So inclusion and presentation is mandatory for success. You can't say we know, we know what happens. We saw a peer reviewed paper, lived experiences and therefore inclusion has come across as something that the G7 must do, as we must do, as this T7 task force has done to actually say, let us have a conversation uh, with the lower middle income countries so that they guide our final recommendations to, uh, to the G7. So I'd like to thank all of us who have attended, of course, the panelists, but also to remind our audience that the next Africa Dialogue is on June 23rd. So please note that June 23rd is when we have the next Building Back Better Dialogue on Africa Dialogues, again, hosted by myself and, uh, and Edwin. And uh, as co-chair and co-host of this dialogue, I also have the pleasure of announcing that the next Africa Health International Conference is going to be in, uh, in March between 6th and 7th. So please, again, book your date, 6th to 7th, 2023. But we will be communicating on the venue, which has become highly competitive between different governments in Africa. So thank you so much. Thanks to my co-hosts, thanks to the panelists, and thanks to my co-chairs on this T7, Anna Katarina and Professor Ilona and all the other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you and be well. See you soon.
Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone.